This brings us to our final topic, designing a synthesis. What I'm going to do is show you a couple of different synthesis problems that I've taken from our text and guide you through the way in which we could do them. Imagine that you're an organic chemist and you've been given the responsibility of converting this starting material into this product. How in the world would you go about doing it? There might be a couple different ways that you might think about approaching that in your mind. As it turns out, however, there exists a method that organic chemists use so frequently that it's actually been given a name. That method is called retrosynthetic analysis. The term was coined by a professor from Harvard named E.J. Corey, who received the Nobel Prize in Chemistry back in 1990 for his writings and work on the subject. The way retrosynthetic analysis works is this. You write down your product, and then you work your way backwards one step at a time, getting simpler as you move along until you get back to your starting material. Let's look at this example. I want to synthesize this ketone. Have I learned any reactions that allow me to make a ketone? Well, of course I have. Earlier in our presentations from this chapter, we learned that you can take an alkyne, and if you treat it with either aqueous acid and mercury sulfate, or hydrobration oxidation conditions, you can turn an alkyne into an enol, and then the enol tautomerizes to form a ketone. Thus, I can work backwards to form this alkyne. Once again, what we've just done is retrosynthetic analysis. I start with my product, and I go backwards to a reactant that could be converted into that product. In the forward direction, I could imagine if I had this alkyne and I treated it either with aqueous acid and mercury sulfate or with hydroboration oxidation conditions, I would generate an enol with a carbon-carbon double bond here and an OH at the left or at the right, depending on the conditions. Because this is a symmetrical alkyne, I would actually get a mixture of both isomers. And then that enol would tautomerize to form the desired ketone. Now one thing that I want to point out is this. When we show chemical reactions in the forward direction, we use these solid black arrows indicated here. When we show chemical reactions in the backwards direction, through this process called retrosynthetic analysis, we draw these arrows that look like this. They're kind of open and not filled in. So now I've come up with this material. How in the world could I make this material from my original starting molecule, 1-butyne? Is there any reaction that we know that allows me to take 1-butyne and add a CH2 and a CH3 to it, which would ultimately yield this product? Of course there is. I learned in our earlier slide that if I take 1-butyne and treat it with a hard base that can remove this terminal hydrogen, and then an alkyl halide, in this case ethyl bromide or ethyl iodide or ethyl chloride, I can add a CH2, CH3 to the end of it that would take me back to my original starting material. Now we will look at this synthetic design in the forward direction by actually placing specific reagents over the arrows. Once again in the forward direction I begin with my original starting material 1-butyne. I treat it with NaNH2 and then in step 2 ethyl bromide. What would happen is this NaNH2 removes this hydrogen, giving me a negatively charged carbon, and that negatively charged carbon comes in and attacks the CH2 and kicks off the bromide, giving me this product. At this point, I can take this molecule and I can treat it with water, sulfuric acid, and mercury sulfate, which is not written here. It will generate an enol with the OH attached to one of these two carbons and the carbon-carbon double bond remaining, which then tautomerizes to give this final product, the ketone. Here's another synthetic problem for you to consider. How in the world could I convert this molecule, ethine, which is also known commonly as acetylene, the same molecule found in acetylene gas torches, into this product, 2-bromopentane? I'm going to analyze this retrosynthetically by writing down the product first. Is there any reaction that I know of that can give me an alkane that has a bromine attached to it? Well, I could imagine that if I started with an alkene, we've learned in our previous chapter that treating that with HBr can put a hydrogen and a bromine on the alkene, giving me indeed an alkyl bromide like this. Thus, if I began with this alkene, treated it with HBr, 
the hydrogen would go on the less substituted external carbon, and the bromine would go on the internal carbon in the carbon-carbon double bond system, giving me this product. Now the question is, how in the world could I go from this compound backwards to something that gets me closer to my original starting material? How in the world do we make an alkene, ultimately originating from some type of alkyne? Well, there are two ways of doing that. As we mentioned earlier, if I take an alkene, a carbon-carbon triple bond, and I treat it with hydrogen gas and Lindler's catalyst, I can convert it into a carbon-carbon double bond and stop. Alternatively, I could take the same alkyne and treat it with sodium or lithium and liquid ammonia at negative 78 degrees Celsius and get the same thing to happen, thus taking me retrosynthetically to this starting material. Now, how in the world could I form this starting material from my original starting material indicated up here? How do I extend the length of an alkyne chain? Well, we treat it with very strong base, usually NaNH2. It removes one of these protons, and then I treat it with whatever length of carbon that I need attached to a bromine or a chlorine or an iodine. In other words, I alkylate that alkyne. In the forward direction, we're going to actually put down all of the specific reagents. Thus, if I treat my starting material with this molecule, sodamid, NaNH2, it will deprotonate one of these two sp hybridized carbons in the alkyne, and then that negative charge will attack this CH2, kicking off the bromide and forming a bond between this carbon right here and this CH2, giving me this product. At this point, I can treat this molecule with H2 and Lindler catalyst and convert the triple bond into a double bond and then stop. If I take this alkene now and treat it with HBr, I can put the bromine on the Markovnikov position, giving me this final product, which is the target in this synthesis. Here's another example. How in the world could I take an alkyne that looks like this, treat it with this alkyl bromide, and eventually make 2,6-dimethylheptane? Well, that's kind of a doozy. Once again, we're going to analyze this retrosynthetically. Beginning with our product, I ask myself, how in the world could I make that product from something simpler that eventually gets me closer toward my original starting materials? Well, I could imagine that if I had an alkyne and treated it with just hydrogen and palladium, not Lindler's catalyst, but just regular hydrogen and palladium, you'll note that it turns the alkyne triple all the way into a carbon-carbon single bond. So you can sort of imagine if I had this alkyne and treated it under those conditions, it would convert into this alkane. How in the world can I go backwards even further? Well, as we've noted earlier, I can make a complex looking alkyne like this by taking a simpler alkyne and treating it with NaNH2 and an alkyl halide, usually an alkyl bromide, like this. So you can imagine if I had this alkyne right here, deprotonated or removed this hydrogen, and treated it with this alkyl bromide, the negative charge on this carbon would come in, attach to this CH2, and kick off the bromide, giving me this. Now, in converse, you could imagine flipping the two. In other words, starting with this type of alkyne and doing the same thing, and it would still get me to the same product. This takes me all the way back to the starting material. Note that in these starting materials, they've used the generic term R, which can represent any type of alkyl chain you want. R prime just represents a different kind of alkyl chain. Both of these different sets of starting materials indeed fit that description. So let's look at this in the forward direction. If I begin with this alkyne, which does indeed fit the description shown here, where R is equal to the CH bonded to two CH3s, and I treated it with NaNH2, known as sodamid, the sodamid would deprotonate this hydrogen, leaving a negative charge on this carbon which would then in turn come and attack the CH2, kicking off the bromide and forming a bond between this CH2 and this carbon in the alkyne and giving me this product. If this intermediate were then treated with hydrogen gas and palladium carbon, it would reduce this carbon-carbon triple bond all the way to a carbon-carbon single bond by putting hydrogens all over it and give me the desired product. We'll now look at our final example for this lecture. Rest assured there are many more examples in your text that I highly encourage you to do. For the students who are taking this from me, I will also give you a number of examples on our problem sets. How in the world would I convert this starting material into this product alcohol? 
Once again, to do this, I like to analyze it retrosynthetically by drawing our product first and working backwards. Do we know any reactions that can give us an OH stuck on the external carbon? Well, yeah, if we think about that for a minute, we have learned that if you take an alkene and you treat it with hydroboration oxidation conditions, it will put the OH on the external carbon, giving us the anti-Markovnikov product. Thus, if I started with this alkene and did that, I should get this product. How in the world can we get this alkene from our original alkyne? Well, remember, I can make an alkene from an alkyne by treating it with hydrogen gas and Lindler's catalyst, or sodium or lithium and liquid ammonia at negative 78. In the forward direction, we'll now write down all of our reagents. I begin with this alkyne and treat it under those conditions I mentioned earlier. It will convert the carbon-carbon triple into a carbon-carbon double and stop. At this point, I can now treat this alkene under hydroboration oxidation conditions and place the OH on the external, less substituted carbon, giving me this alcohol, the anti-Markovnikov product. That brings us to the end of this lecture and the end of our discussion from Chapter 6's coverage of the reactions of alkynes. I hope you've had as good of a time with this as I have. I look forward to seeing you when I revert back to Chapter 5 in our next lecture set in which we will address the wonderful world of stereochemistry. Until then, have an enjoyable rest of your day.